to the church in Galatia. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For you reap whatever you sow. If you sow to your own flesh, you will reap corruption from the flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, you will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So let us not grow weary in doing what is right, for we will reap at harvest time if we do not give up. So then, whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, and especially for those of the family of faith. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the world. Amen. Thanks be to God. A few years ago, I remember having a conversation with a, with a group of pastors, and we were talking about, of all things, parenting. We were talking about parenting and, uh, and what the best practices were for raising our children to be gracious, to, be great, uh, to, to have gratitude, to be kind, thoughtful, and faithful. And it, we have those, I mean, if you have young children, I'm sure you're having conversations like that as well. But one thing a colleague and friend of mine, Reverend Robbie Kanzler, said really stuck out to me, and it's something that I've, I've held on to ever since she said it. And she said that when, talk, when raising their, their children, they talk about watering the weeds and watering the flowers. That's a metaphor for their parenting techniques. And what she meant, for the, for, for what she meant by this was quite simple, but really profound. In terms of parenting, she talked about watering the weeds and watering the flowers in reference to the attention and energy and response that parents gave to their children for their negative behavior and their positive behavior, respectively. That is, are you giving all of your attention to to your children when they misbehave, when they are disobedient, when they're fighting with their siblings? Are you constantly correcting and reprimanding? Or are you giving them as much, if not more, attention when they do share, when they are kind, when they are working hard, when they're being obedient, when they are expressing gratitude? What's that, what's that phrase in marketing, any PR is good PR? For children, especially young children, any attention is good attention because guess what? It's attention. When our children only get our undivided attention when we are disciplining or correcting or rebuking them, they, they learn to do that behavior more. It's counterintuitive because that's when we actually respond to them because that's when they get mom and dad's attention. So if they know they're going to get mom's, only mom and dad's undivided attention when they are being disciplined, that encourages that behavior. However, if our children know that they have our undivided attention and and affection when they display these positive attributes, guess what? It encourages them to continue to do them and to behave that way because they know they are seen. What are you watering? The weeds or the flowers? To what are you giving your attention, energy, affection, and time? These negative things that you wish you didn't see so much or the good and beautiful things you wish you saw more of. Because the truth is, sometimes, and I'm not going to, I don't want to make a sweeping generalization, but oftentimes poor behaviors don't always need to be addressed in order to be remedied. Sometimes what is required is positive engagement and positive reinforcement. Those negative things are often corrected on their own when good and beautiful things are celebrated and acknowledged. And it struck me, after I thought about Reverend Robbie's metaphor, that it applies to maybe a lot more than just parenting. I don't know, anybody that's been in a marriage ever can apply to this as well. With your wife or your husband, are you watering the weeds or are you watering the flowers? Do you point out your partner's faults more than you celebrate their successes? Because if we spend our time always correcting and rebuking our spouse, I hate to break it to you, but that's probably what you're going to see more often than not. Not just on the behavior of your partner, but on your own vision. If we celebrate our partner's successes and virtues, well, I think we begin to see more and more of them, and things that irritate us are, will be more likely to fall away. What are we watering, church? The the flowers or the weeds. And as I was reflecting on Galatians chapter 6, I recognized that I think this is maybe just an alternative and modern way of saying what Paul said in Galatians chapter 6. 
you reap what you sow tends to have a really negative connotation, doesn't it? When we hear the phrase, well, you reap what you sow, like we only really say that when people have negative things happen to them, right? I don't know that, I don't know the last time somebody had something really exciting happen in their life and somebody says to them, well, you reap what you sow. That's weird, right? Why is what we reap only negative? I don't think that's what Paul is saying in Galatians chapter 6, because it's not only for negative things, it's for good and beautiful things as well. Guess what? If you water flowers, what do you get? Flowers. It's amazing. The phrase, God will not be mocked in Galatians 6, has been really standing out to me this week as I've been preparing for today. As it relates to reaping what you sow, this is, this is saying that you cannot plant weeds and grow flowers. You cannot sow dandelions and reap daffodils. That's not how it works. It's just not how it works. And God will not be mocked. What what that's saying is, it's saying you can't give your time and your energy and your resources to things that bring brokenness and decay and then all of a sudden be surprised when you don't have life. God will not be mocked. You can't put all of your energy and life into broken and decaying things and then expect to have wholeness come out on the other side. How frequently are we giving our life to things that don't bear good fruit and then we get upset with God when our lives aren't what we'd hoped they'd be? God will not be mocked. We can't put all of our energy and life into broken things and then be surprised when we get broken things. What are you watering? As parents, what are you watering? As spouses, what are you watering? As disciples of Jesus, what are you watering? Because things that get water grow. Things that are watered will grow. And so that is the question I have for us today. As a church, what are we watering? That wasn't the sermon, by the way. That was just all the beginning of the metaphor that I'm going to be working with, all right? Paul's letter to the church in Galatia was not a letter written to individuals about their own personal piety as much as it was written to a community and their work and life together. Galatians chapter 6, if you read it in the original, it's in its plural language, not singular language. Paul is writing to the church about what they are sowing. He says, whenever we have an opportunity, let us work for the good of all, which brings me to what so many of you have been so confused by this morning. What is going on above your heads? Y'all like the new decor for the sanctuary? It's beautiful, right? This week we, we, lowered the, we lowered the ceiling. We installed a new ceiling this week. I hope you like it. I don't know if you felt a little awkward or a little uncomfortable. I can't really walk down the aisle that well. I think Henry and I may be the few ones who need to end game. Maybe we need to duck as we walk through here. But we installed this new ceiling and I hope you like it because it's here on purpose. It's here because, I really can't believe I'm about to say this, this month is my 10th anniversary of being your pastor here at Hastings Church of the Nazarene. We moved, thank you, we moved here in 2014 with my first official day being September 14th, so we are right at that 10-year mark. And so, I don't know, 10 years, a decade, something happens when you hit this mark professionally. This, I don't know, this year, the last few months especially, and I'm sure going into the next few months, I've been reflecting on our work together. You're probably going to get some nostalgia, okay? Ten years is, is quite a while. Um, a lot has happened in a, dec- in a decade here. It's crazy to think about how much has changed in ten years. People have found hope. Lives have been transformed truly. New ministries have developed and grown. As you know, measuring the health of a church is a challenge. What do you measure? What's an appropriate thing to look at? It's not just about attendance, buildings, and cash. 
the ABCs of the empire, as we call them. Those may be valuable, but those are not the only metrics for evaluating what, the, what a healthy church is. That's why we created the missional movement, which you see out on the wall in the foyer. The five movements we measure are engage, welcome, bridge, belong, become. And our rule of life, the metrics for this system are threefold. Worship, service, and discipleship, and a little bit of a plug that you're going to want to be here for our series starting next Sunday. That's called Restoration, which is emphasizing these three things, worship, service, and discipleship. You want to be here for that. But the things that we want to measure are not just numbers. They're kind of intangible. They're kind of transient things. Are we worshiping together, serving together, and discipling together? And there are some seasons in my last 10 years here where we've been more fruitful than others. And as I've reflected on our first 10 years here together as your pastoral family, I've come to a conclusion. You may disagree with me, and that's okay, but I've spent a lot of time in prayer about this, and I've come to this conclusion. I think we have a ceiling. A ceiling. I think as Hastings Church of the Nazarene, we have a ceiling for what we imagine we are capable of being and becoming. I'll be honest, this is the third time I have felt us approaching this ceiling again. We have this rhythm as a church. We go through these seasons where we do really well at building momentum, of getting people rowing in the same direction is what I like to call it. Don't fix it. Don't worry about it. We have this rhythm of of building momentum, of rowing in the same direction, getting people on board together, developing new ministries, and, and having this really exciting stuff start to take place in the church. We have excitement and energy, but then for some reason, there, there appears to be this ceiling that we approach, that we, we butt up against, and we just can't break through it. We may push the ceiling up a little bit. We may raise the ceiling a little bit, but we don't actually break through it. Now, a little bit of a history lesson for you. The first time this happened that I, rec- that I, I, I think in hindsight I recognized was in about 2016, 2017, about two or three years into my ministry here. New families started coming to church. We started getting some children. We generated new ministries for kids, and a wave was swelling a little bit, but we didn't really ride it, and I don't know that we had the structures in place to really kind of ride that wave of the Spirit at that time. New things grew from it, which was beautiful, but that moment came and passed, and, and then we kind of had this fresh swell, it seemed like, in, in, in about 2019, 2020. Our children and youth ministries were beginning to thrive. We were talking about, honestly, on the, as a staff back then, we were talking about how we might need to add a second service if the moment, momentum were to continue. We were, not the numbers aren't everything, we were averaging about 113 in worship every Sunday in, uh, towards the end of 2019. And that's a lot for this sanctuary. It's not just about the numbers, though. It was the development of new initiatives, the, the commitment and the presence of people in our congregation, and our, our work in the community grew. Well, I, I think we all know what happened about four years ago, right? It felt like some beautiful things were taking place in this church and we were, we were, the spirit was moving. We were riding the wave of the spirit to, to a good and beautiful future, approaching that ceiling and then COVID. Now we've made it through that initial COVID crisis, but not unscathed, not unscathed. Surviving COVID came with recognized, I mean, admittedly and not surprisingly, a loss of momentum. We, were, we had approached that ceiling again that we had encountered pr- previously, but this time, due to circumstances way beyond our control, we had put together a structure in place for us to be able to, to, to move forward and break through the ceiling, but then we all were stuck at home for eight months. 
The momentum subsided a bit. We pressed on that ceiling again, but we didn't break, for, break through. So now, a few years later after that, here we are again, church. I don't know if you can sense it as well, but this last year and building up to it, we've done a good job, a really good job of building up some momentum. It feels like we're rowing in the same direction again. There are a lot of exciting ministries taking place at the church. We've put a lot of work into our children and youth ministries. I don't think everybody recognizes how much time and energy has gone into your children and youth ministries. This summer, Lighthouse Youth grew together in some incredible ways, beautiful ways. And we really need to thank Derek and Rachel and Art, who was really, in, in, really invested, and some of our new helpers with, you, with Lighthouse Youth, with Antoine and Bianca. We've had a lot of momentum building in our Lighthouse Ministries. This is wonderful. A ministry that set itself up to disciple our teens this school year. And this summer was a really important summer for Adventure Kids. A lot of energy went into basically rebuilding our children's ministry from the ground up. Rachel Hackett and Patty Boji Gibbons, working with their team, which is a large team, have put a lot of time into rebuilding our entire ministry with a new policy for our children, which the board and the congregation are going to vote on here shortly. But our ministry that will disciple our little ones to see Jesus in every area of their life. What a phenomenal VBS we had this year, too. If you go down in the basement and you go in the Adventure Kids room down there, the big room, you see all the space stuff is still there. Our children learned and experienced how God is the God of space. And guess what? That was not a canned or prepackaged vacation Bible school. We built that in-house, all of it. Not only children and teens. I don't know if you remember just a few months ago, we had the largest membership class on record. You remember how full this platform was? And it was the first time in our history that we had a bilingual membership with the help of Teresa Bielin. Now, I don't think I'm speaking incorrectly when I say that we are the most diverse congregation in our community. Our staff, our platform, and our congregation have been growing diverse. And we've added a lot of new ministries with the English language connections, with, with our multi-ethnic ministry, which is being realized in our soccer tournament in just a few weeks, and the Barry County Ethnic Food Fest the week after that. Really exciting things are taking place, church. We're building momentum. And so I have to ask, can you feel the ceiling pressing down on us a little bit? Because I can I can. And I'm thrilled about all the new things God is doing in our congregation. I, God is up to something right now. I believe that we are in the midst of a swell of the Spirit's movement in our church and in our community. But if I can be honest with you, I am also a little bit apprehensive. I'm not apprehensive about what God is capable of doing. Because God can do more than we could ever ask or imagine. I'm not apprehensive about all the beautiful things God is up to in our church. I'm apprehensive that as we approach this ceiling again, we will find ourselves pressed up against it and not break through it. Church, I don't, I don't know. Maybe this is a decade of my ministry here speaking as I reflected on this, but I believe God is in the business of doing big things. I believe God is in the business of doing great things, more things than we could ever ask or imagine. Do you feel a little comfortable right now in this space with a low ceiling? As you were walking through this morning and you felt the ceiling right above your head, as you were standing and singing, were you comfortable looking up at these monitors? Some of us, yes. A lot of us, no. Well, good. Good. 
Because I don't believe we should be comfortable when we're not living up to the potential that God has created for us. And to be frank, I don't know that we have yet to realize the potential God has for this church. That's not to diminish the good and beautiful things God is doing, but I believe God has a great future for us, and I believe God has more for us than we can even imagine. I know that's true because when I look at this church and the makeup of the congregation, there is so much potential. So much potential because when I look up at the ceiling we are about to hit our heads up against for the third time, like this ceiling here, I see something on the other side of it. When I look at the ceiling we're approaching in our ministries and in our capabilities, I see that there's a little bit more on the other side. When I look at the ceiling we are about to butt up against, I see that there's light coming through from the other side. I see holes in the ceiling. When I look at it and I feel that we're running up against, I realize, and I hope we all can realize, it's not actually a ceiling. It's nothing but paper and cannot actually stop what God is capable of doing. The ceiling we keep hitting as a church is imaginary. It's not real. It is our fears. It is our lack of commitment. It is our lack of presence. As we are finding ourselves building momentum with new ministries, with new families, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, my question is this. Are we going to find ourselves pressed up against this imaginary ceiling again, whatever that thing is that has hindered us from realizing God's potential? will Will we run up against it again and be afraid to push through it? Or will we recognize that it's imaginary? Some of us are maybe taller than others. But for those who are able or for those who want... I want us to put this into practice today. Stand up, church. Some of you, I think, have wanted to do this all morning. Can anybody reach that? Anybody reach this ceiling? Yeah, grab it. Reach through on the other side. Grab this ceiling. Does this have any power to stop you from pulling it down? Can anybody grab it? Can it, is it too strong? Is anybody not strong enough to rip this down? Now, look, look. We may have just made a little bit of a mess, but guess what? Guess what? There is more for this church than an imaginary barrier that we erect ourselves that prevent us from achieving what God is capable of doing. Y'all can be seated. God has been, church, I hope you know, God has been putting in front of us an incredible opportunity. The Spirit is doing something incredibly fresh and incredibly exciting in this church. And if we are old wineskins, the the work of the Spirit will just rip right through, through us and move on to a space where His presence can flourish. I believe that God has greater things for us, and I hope you do too. I hope I'm not alone in that. This is all well and good to acknowledge, but unless the church can see a path forward through this barrier that we've constructed for ourselves, we might just miss the potential that God has for us. This is why we read Galatians chapter 6. This is why I gave us the metaphor of watering weeds and watering flowers. If you want to realize the good and beautiful things that God is capable of doing in our church and in our community, guess what? We water the flowers. We give our time and our energy and our resources to things that will bear fruit for the kingdom. If we want to reap God's harvest, we need to sow kingdom seeds. 
And here at Hastings Church of the Nazarene, we've said that there are three things that we're going to use as our metrics for evaluating faithfulness, fruitfulness. And those three things are worship, service, discipleship. Now, it's not just about numbers and totals. It's not just about how many people show up or how much money that we receive. Those aren't kingdom metrics. They're not unimportant. But when we talk about worship, it's not just about how many people show up on any given Sunday. Though that's not insignificant. It's more about how much of a priority worship is in our lives. You know what the latest statistics say about people who consider themselves regular attenders? People who say, I'm a regular attender, do you know how often they, on average, go to church? Once a month. I'm a regular attender at once a month. I'm sorry, but... If your kid only shows up to practice a quarter of the time, how often is the coach going to put him in? It seems like we're quick to sacrifice worship for the sake of sports and family, but how quickly are we going to sacrifice family and sports for the sake of worshiping the Lord and gathering with his people? It's less about how many people we have in the space and more about how much of a priority is it to gather with the people of God. Seems like in our culture, we're quick to sacrifice this in the name of everything else. And my question for the church in America is, how quickly will we sacrifice that in order to be with the Lord in his gathered community? But it's also not just about being here, but it's about showing up, truly showing up, being present bringing our whole selves to the Lord. Worship is not just a box we check off. It is a place that we bring our entire selves vulnerable, exposed. That's worship. Now, when we talk about service, it's not just about how much time, talent, or treasure we gave, though that's not insignificant. It's about whether our service is given from our excess or is given sacrificially. Do we give of our lives from our extra when there's a little bit left over? Do we give off the top? Or will we give of our time, our talent, and our treasure even when it matters? Even when we might feel it. Even when we feel like, maybe I don't have the time to do this. Maybe I don't have the skills for this thing. My resources are feeling like maybe they're not there. I love this old chorus that we used to sing in the church. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. There's, there's more to it. The sacrifice of praise. How often is our praise sacrificial? Or how much of of our praise is skimming off the top that we don't really need? When we talk about service, it's sacrificial service. Now when we talk about discipleship, this third thing we've said really matters to us. It's not just about gathering information on the Bible, though that's not insignificant. Discipleship, church, listen, it's more than just Bible knowledge. Though that's important. It's about giving yourself to a community in true fellowship. And if I could be honest, this is the thing that I believe our church truly needs attention and affection. As a church, I think we need attention and affection for discipleship. I'm going to go back a little bit. Church of the Nazarene. it was, a, it, was, it was a unique experience. <clears throat> Maybe some of you remember this. We would always have Sunday school and, and worship. That was the rhythm on Sunday mornings. You would have Sunday school, then you would have worship, and then there was always a Sunday night service. And Maybe some of you remember the day when more people attended Sunday school than they did worship. People would come to Sunday school, then they would leave before worship. Can you believe that? As a church, we have roughly about 50% of our congregation that's engaged in discipleship. And that is higher than the national metric. 
but it used to be in the church of the Nazarene. You came to Sunday school, and it was not a surprise if people left for worship, which feels so foreign. Why did that happen, and what changed? In 1977, the church of the Nazarene changed our metrics. What you measure is what you treasure. We changed our metrics in 1977. We always have to report numbers to the denomination. And before 1977, from 1907 to 1977, the number one metric the denomination was asking for us was, what are your discipleship numbers? We evaluated a healthy church based on how many people came to Sunday school, not came to worship. Then in 1977, we switched those metrics and we said, now we want you to report how many people come to your worship services. Then all of a sudden, our worship services became prioritized. What you measure is what you treasure. See, I think we need a little bit of attention for discipleship, which is why we're starting new groups this fall. And I, I don't know if you know this, we have one group that, one, one of our fellowship groups that meets during the Sunday school hour that could really use some TLC. We, it, we, used, we used to call it, I don't know if this was, this is how it was referred to me. I'm not going to take blame for this. The super senior class. You know what I'm talking about? The class that meets in room 201 right behind me. It's now called Faith Connections, okay? It has a name. Don Dorman, Betty Windorf used to be part of that class. Don Service, Janine Service used to be a part of that class. Fred Saudi was a part of that class. Martin Bigley used to teach that class. That class is not what it once was. Partly because we've lost some of our saints. Because the church militant is now the church triumphant. Because they, we gather with them as we worship together through the communion of saints. And I'm telling you, we do not have age-based classes anymore. Both of these groups that meet at 9.30 before worship, there's a range of, of ages in there. But past, the group that Pastor Gabe has taken on, Faith Connections, that meets at 9.30 in room 201, needs some love. There's quality discipleship taking place in that moment. And it needs some support. But we're also starting new midweek groups this year. And if you're not yet a part of a fellowship group, either on Sunday mornings or during the week, please let us know. It's in the bulletin to let Rachel Hughes in the office know. Email the office. Talk to me after church. But here's the thing, church. We will have a thriving discipleship ministry when we prioritize discipleship. When we will bring the sacrifice of praise. When we are willing to give up our extracurriculars for the sake of discipleship. We will have a thriving children's ministry when families prioritize bringing their kids to Sunday school and worship for children's church. We will have a thriving youth ministry when parents and teens prioritize Lighthouse Youth and bring their friends to it. We will have enough to fund all of these initiatives, all of the good and beautiful things God is doing when we prioritize giving to Christ's kingdom community, the church. Here's the thing, church. The structures are all there. I am so thrilled by the work that your board and staff and leadership have put together to create systems that will help us flourish. We have put together structures for this to work. But unless all of us, the congregation, unless we all can water the flowers until the church prioritizes worship, service, and discipleship, we will not realize God's potential for us. Until we all collectively, communally recognize that the church is not what it is without me, we will find ourselves up against that ceiling again. Ah, I don't know if we can, it's a lot. The more we live into the practices of worship, service, and discipleship, I truly believe, church, we will begin to see all that God can accomplish. This is what it means to water the flowers. And I can't tell you what all God will do. God is wild. 
God is wild, and God can do more than we could ever ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work in the church. So, what are we watering? What has our attention and our energy? The weeds or the flowers? As I approach my 10th anniversary, I do, I do believe, church, I mean it, that God is not done with us yet. I believe we're just beginning to see the full potential of what God can do in this church. God has a lot more work for us to accomplish. The question is, what are we watering? What are we sowing? What are we giving ourselves over to? Those are a great idea. Church, as I wrap up my sermon this morning, I just hope that we can be encouraged that God has a lot more for us to accomplish. God has a lot more for us. God's future for us is brighter than the future we could imagine. And it's worth giving ourselves over to. And this is the good news of Jesus Christ for us today.